Let us start. Uh, welcome to everyone from several continents, several time zones, uh, to this Agrarian Change uh, webinar organized by the Journal of Agrarian Change and the Department of Development Studies at SOAS University of London. I'm Jens Lerke from the Journal of Agrarian Change and from SOAS, and I'll be chairing the session. I'm also joined by two, two Journal of Agrarian Change co-organizers, Shreya Senna from Queen Mary, University of London, and Enrique Castagnon from UCL. Today, we have the pleasure of welcoming Kumal Chohan from the Indian Institute of Technology, Kanpur, India, as our speaker. Uh, Kumal is a PhD research scholar in sociology at the Indian Institute of Technology. She's presently finishing her PhD on political economy of female rural labor relations within sugarcane farming in Western Uttar Pradesh in North India. She has also spent time at the University of Göttingen and she has published on labor migration and new bondage in Western UP. The title of Kamal's talk today is Conceptualizing Bondedness and on Freedom, the case of Dalit women agricultural laborers in Western Uttar Pradesh. The presentation will be followed by a question and answer session. And all that's left for me to remind you before we start is that we will be recording the session. If you don't want to be recorded, please don't use your audio and video. You can find the full program of our webinar and seminar series on our website, Agrarian Questions. And that's all I need to say. So with this, let's start to today's program. Komal, over to you for the next 50 minutes or so for your presentation. Yeah, thank you, Jens. Uh, I'll just share my screen. Yeah, okay. Uh, so hello everybody. The, the title of my presentation today is Conceptualizing Bondedness and Unfreedom, the case of Dalit women agricultural laborers in Western UP. So this is a part of my PhD project here. And uh, yeah, so I'll start with it. Yeah. So um so debates uh, among, okay. am I audible? Like, do I need to turn off my video or something? Is it fine? Um, there's a bit of a of a of an echo, but uh, please try and go ahead. And if it gets worse, then then you might have to do it. Okay, fine. Okay, so uh, so debates among scholars and activists regarding unfree labor have gained new power in the past few years. It has uh, often been uh, argued that uh, unfree labor cannot uh, exist in the capitalist mode of production, uh, and it is a relic of the past. Uh, due to exclusive possession over land and credit in feudal times, uh, um, uh, unfree labor was the main source of surplus uh, extraction through usury which led to an intermin interminable cycle of indebtedness for the vulnerable and marginalized peasants. Uh, scholars have also contended that forced labor, uh, unfree labor, uh, 
and pre-labor should not be seen as binaries. It is a, a, a continuum and it lies on a spectrum on which uh, all other re labor relations lie and, and should be analyzed in that way. So contemporary labor relations should be viewed as within the capitalist mode of production uh, uh, in India and uh, rather than the pre-capitalist modes of production. Uh, also, the meaning of bondage is not singular. That is, bondage lies on a scale ranging from scenarios where laborers are completely bonded uh, and have no agency whatsoever to exit those conditions, uh, and to scenarios where there are some uh, exit conditions available, exit options available. Uh, so, although there have been political victories for Dalits uh, in Western Uttar Pradesh, but it has not unfolded into better socio-economic conditions on ground. Uh, many studies on neo-bondage have registered that bonded laborers uh, uh, belong to vulnerable and marginalized sections of the society, that is the scheduled caste. Uh, the rise of bondage takes place in those communities where the subordination is historically rooted in the consciousness of both the employers and the workers. And uh, in this particular case that I'm looking today, caste and debt are intertwined with one another and they produce a perfect recipe for labor domination. Also, debt is not so simple to define. It is not just merely an economic transaction. Uh, it involves an amount, a price, uh, a duration, but it also has various social and moral meanings that are instrumental in shaping debtors' strategies, tactics, and subjectivities. So uh, the, uh, the socioeconomy of debt, which has already been talked of, uh, in literature, approaches debt as a, a power relation between the debtor and a creditor, which is inseparable from broader forces related to interdependencies. So by empirically exploring uh, debt as a material transaction, as a power relationship, it is clear that debt never acts in isolation, but it is always an articulation of the uh, other forms of interdependencies. Ultimately, this particular form of articulation uh, is what can help exploit, protect, or emancipate people, or it can do all of them. Uh, also, there have been shifts in the financial landscape of rural India with the emergence of new forms of financial exploitation and transformation of social relations through the intermediary of debt. So debt has a wider uh, role in process of, uh, processes of exploitation, protection, and emancipation. Uh, moving to the context, so uh, uh, this my field area is in Muzaffarnagar district, which is uh, in the western part of Uttar Pradesh, the map shows here. Uh, this is a, a Google Earth image of the two villages. As you can see, the two villages are nearby one another. Karoli is a bigger one. Uh, Kachpur is a smaller village. I use the pseudonyms here uh, for the villages. Uh, then this is a village uh, uh, map of Kachpur where uh, the blue households uh, uh, are the Dalit households, the pink ones, uh, 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 the yellow ones are the Rajput households. And you can clearly see the spatial segregation and how uh, geographically the, the villages are uh, designed. Uh, similarly, this is uh, uh, the map of uh, uh, Karoli, where Dalit uh, households are again in blue, the Rajput households are in yellow, uh, there are other households, uh, uh, the green ones are the Valmiki households, which also come under the scheduled caste, the blue ones are specifically the Chamar households, the green ones are the Valmiki households, the uh, scheduled caste who are mostly engaged in uh, uh, manual scavenging. Uh, then a little about the methodology and how did I uh, collect data for uh, this particular uh, project. So uh, the arguments presented here are based on ethnographic data that I collected in Kachpur and Karoli, two villages in Mujaffanagar district of Western UP. Uh, so I conducted fieldwork in these two villages from April 2019 to March 2020. Initially, I conducted a household level survey of around 600 households to comprehend the socioeconomic features in the village and identify the various classes of labor. Uh, then, depending upon the, uh, upon the household's availability, accessibility, and readiness to participate in the research, I conducted in-depth semi-structured interviews of 74 uh, Dalit women. I also conducted focus group discussions uh, of Dalit women to explore uh, the various dimensions of exploitation at work which might not come up in individual interactions, uh, 
uh, and might come up in such focus group discussions. Uh, I also interviewed upper caste money lenders in the two villages uh, to better understand the money lending processes and uh, uh, the sociology of the uh, entire uh, uh, credit and debt relations. I then triangulated the data from uh, these uh, sources, household level surveys, uh, in-depth interviews and focus group discussions. So uh, since due, uh, I had to uh, uh, pause my field work due to the COVID-19 pandemic, I was not uh, physically present in the field uh, post-March 2020. So in continuation of this field work, I collected data through telephonic interviews with the participants in the uh, field. Data collection over telephone was possible because I had already spent a considerable amount of time in the field and uh, I had prior connections uh, uh, in the field. Uh, so this is the village profile. Uh, so these two villages are situated uh, 12 kilometers from Muzaffarnagar district and are thoroughly connected with the city. Uh, the two uh, villages chosen have varied caste compositions. In Kachpur, as you can see, Dalits are uh, numerically dominant and uh, uh, the Rajputs are lesser in number, whereas in Karoli, the Rajputs are numerically dominant and the Dalits are lesser in number. So uh, this difference between the two villages also shape the social reality of the villages differently, which uh, will come ahead in the presentation. So the data was uh, uh, collected from these two villages. In Kachpur, here the Dalits, uh, where the Dalits are numerically dominant, the village head, the Pradhan, was also a Dalit. Uh, here Dalits were not completely landless uh, uh, due to the recent uh, Chakbandi process, that, uh, which is a land consolidation process. Uh, that took place recently in uh, 2016. And after that, land was redistributed. Um, out of 134 Dalit households, 48% were uh, wholly landless and had no ownership of cultivable land. Whereas 52% were marginal landholders with the uh, land holdings less than 0.5 acres. Uh, in Karoli, where uh, Rajputs dominated, the conditions of Dalits was much more worse as the Pradhan of the Dal uh, village was also a Rajput whose family was known to be in a caste war in the Dalits previously. And also access to uh, uh, social welfare schemes was also uh, embedded in patronage ties. So uh, Dalits were much more uh, 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 like they were in a more precarious condition in, in this particular village. So um, in this village, the Dalits were completely landless, except for a few families who had uh, got government jobs and had managed to buy some land uh, from their savings. Uh, seasonal uh, migration in the two uh, study villages was rampant. Uh, except for marriage, women migrated much less than men. The only seasonal migration of Dalit women was with their families to uh, Kolus, which are uh, jaggery making units. Uh, to Chhattisgarh uh, and to brick kilns, mainly to Punjab and Haryana, where they were not only exposed to harsh working conditions, but they uh, also uh, experienced significant forms of bondedness. So the primary reason for out-migration from the village in search of uh, employment was the precariousness of agricultural work, which was uh, seasonal. Dalit men from Kachpur who were marginal landholders generally worked in the nearby city of Muzaffarnagar uh, and commuted on a daily basis. They were engaged in various uh, jobs like working in factories, working as daily wage laborers, as construction sites, as salespersons in electrical or clothes shop, or as uh, marriage bandmasters. On the other hand, seasonal migration of entire Dalit households to Brickles and Kolus were less uh, in this village. Dalit households that had meager land holdings uh, did not migrate seasonally as, as they had to tend to their land, which was uh, uh, a source of food security for a few months. Since the Dalits in Karoli were mostly landless, uh, many of them migrated to the brickels of Golus with their entire uh, families. Some migrated to works in chips or garment factories, while others worked in uh, construction sites in Uttarakhand, Punjab, or Haryana, leaving their wives and children behind. Only those families stayed in the village who were heavily indebted to the landed upper caste Rajputs, who acted both as their employers and money lenders. Uh, the males worked as knockers for uh, or servants for a monthly honorarium in these households. And uh, in Kachpur, where the condition of Dalits were relatively better, 
they relied on other sources of credit and did not want it to tie down for employment to a particular uh, upper caste household. Uh, so uh, this is the credit market uh, in the uh, village, the various sources of credit, what are the rates of interest, what are the collateral that is required and the maximum amount of loans uh, that are offer, uh, offered. So there were numerous uh, informal sources of credit in the villages for Dalits. They borrowed from multiple sources uh, ranging from Rajput money lenders in the village, private money lenders in the city of Muzaffarnagar, also known as uh, pawn shops or pawn brokers. Uh, credit giving private uh, microfinance institutions in the village or money lenders from their own community, that is uh, Dalit money lenders. So in Kachpur, there were two big landlords who owned more than 50 acres of land in the names of different family members uh, uh, and also acted as professional money lenders. They had practiced money lending for a few generations now, and uh, it is often said in the village uh, that the land that they had consolidated over the years was the result of grabbing uh, the mortgage lands of Dalits when they failed to repay the loans. Um, in Karoli, where the Rajputs uh, dominated, uh, uh, four big landlords owned more than 50 acres of land in the names of different family members, and they acted as professional money lenders. The si size of loans dispersed uh, uh, ranged from 30,000 to a maximum amount of 1 lakh rupees. Here, the loans given by the upper caste uh, uh, Rajputs were mostly without collateral, but uh, on higher interest rates, which range from 5% to 10% uh, per month. Then, uh, however, interest uh, uh, rates were not fixed in the village and uh, ranged from 5% to 10%. The loans were uh, given based on a verbal agreement. There was no written contract involved. Uh, this gave an upward hand to the money lenders and gave them the window to act upon their own self-interest. There had been uh, cases in the villages where interest rates were increased uh, uh, without uh, giving any notice or without informing uh, uh, the Dalit households uh, because of uh, if somebody denied working for them or some other unpleasant uh, incident took place. So these kind of instances were common in the villages uh, because there was uh, no contract involved in such kind of loans. Uh, there were mediators involved, however, in uh, cases of unfamiliarity with the creditor who took guarantee for the debtor. Nevertheless, the mediator was not obligated to pay for the loans in case of non-repayment. However, the mediator was expected to exert social pressure on the debtor to repay the loans. Since the loans uh, were given without a written contract and the terms of uh, the loans were spelled verbally, there was no legal binding to pay back the loan. But uh, in cases of non-repayment, Rajputs exerted uh, socio-political and moral pressure on the Dalits by harassing and demeaning them on an everyday basis. There was no physical violence per se involved in extorting these loans, but the Dalits themselves felt obligated uh, uh, to pay back the loans as they were afraid to, of losing their dignity and honor in the village. Uh, in Kachpur, where the Dalits dominated, four members of the Dalit community also acted as moneylenders. All of them except one had a regular government job. Uh, the three of them worked as uh, office boys uh, or peons in different government departments in uh, Muzaffarnagar, uh, while one brewed local uh, liquor in the house, which was his primary source of income. Thus, these four households had a stable monthly income, which enabled them in, uh, to enter into the uh, business of money lending in the village. These households were not dependent on precarious daily wage agricultural work and hence had the capital to invest in the uh, uh, money lending business. Uh, since they were not as economically sound as the upper caste Rajput money lenders, they lent small amount of loans uh, and the maximum uh, amount of loans that they gave was uh, around rupees 10,000. Uh, loans were given collateral free as they were given within the community uh, with an interest of 3% per month. Uh, the Dalit moneylender gave loans to the people of their community and hence uh, the role of mediators uh, was uh, very limited uh, in these uh, cases. Uh, also, it's not mentioned in this table, but few Rajput women also acted as moneylenders in the study villages. And uh, um, in the absence uh, of their male counterparts who had migrated uh, from the village in search of employment, Dalit women approached the Rajput women for loans in times of distress, for instance, during health emergencies and even for consumption or ceremonial uh, purposes. 
Dalit women could not directly approach uh, uh, the Rajput men for loans as they had to observe Parda or a veil from them and were restricted by patriarchal uh, boundaries. Uh, these loans were of small amounts ranging from Rs. 5,000 to Rs. 10,000 and were uh, given in two ways. Uh, if the borrower had nothing to produce as collateral, uh, the uh, loan was given at 3% of interest rate and if the borrower had something to produce as collateral, something as small as a gold nose pin, uh, the loans were given without interest. So Dalit women produced uh, even their nose pins as collateral in times of distress, and they, they, uh, and they had no negotiation uh, power in such situations. Uh, in exchange for these loans, Dalit women had to perform, uh, uh, in addition to uh, the interest rates and the collateral, they had to perform some tasks for the Rajput households, like cleaning their courtyards, making uh, uh, hearths for them, or cow dung cakes for them. Um, as I discussed earlier, Dalit men from Kachpur who were marginal landholders generally worked in the nearby city of Muzaffarnagar and were engaged in various uh, variety of uh, jobs. For them, an additional source of credit was their employer uh, in outside the village. So some shop owners in Muzaffarnagar also worked as money lenders and gave loans to the people from nearby villages at an interest rate of 3% to 5% per month uh, uh, in exchange for some collateral. But if one was working in their shop, these loans were given without uh, collateral. So apart from this, other sources of credit in Kachpur uh, were private microfinance companies or the upper caste uh, Rajput landlords. There were four different uh, uh, microfinance companies in uh, Kachpur and two different uh, microfinance companies operating in Karoli, which provided uh, loans to the villagers. Availing credit from these microfinance companies was more uh, prevalent in Kachpur than in Karoli. So the reason behind this was that one had to pay the installments very strictly uh, every week for these microfinance companies. And for Dalit households in Kachpur, whose men were uh, employed in the city, uh, to a greater extent than in Karoli, it was easier to pay these in, uh, installments compared to Dalit households in Karoli, where there was rampant migration to brick kills or kolos and uh, other uh, uh, garment factories or chips uh, factories. Uh, in the absence of uh, their male counterparts, it was also a tedious task uh, uh, for women to arrange for these uh, weekly installments. With the coming of uh, private microfinance companies, uh, uh, in the villages, the dominance of Rajput had uh, money lenders had reduced significantly, but uh, it uh, the picture is more complicated than it seems, which I'll be discussing ahead. Uh, now the Dalits had other avenues of availing credit when they needed it, though the freedom of choice uh, was limited by various uh, uh, factors, which I'll elaborate ahead. It still provided them some respite to uh, from the uh, to the Dalits from usury. Uh, the loans given by microfinance companies were collateral free with interest uh, rates ranging from 18 to 22 percent per annum, uh, which was actually cheaper than interest rates of other sources of credit. Uh, in addition to this, the principal amount of microcredit also kept on decreasing with each installment, which was not the case with uh, any other uh, type of uh, credit source. So the interest rates of loans given by the private microfinance institutions were lower than charged by the upper caste Rajput money lender, which was a, uh, a massive relief uh, to the Dalits. Uh, I'll briefly talk about uh, a little bit more about the uh, context uh, of uh, uh, Dalit households and Dalit women. So uh, Dalit, uh, uh, there was no out-migration of Dalit women except for seasonal migration to Brickkills and uh, Kolus. Uh, and, and Dalits from both the study villages uh, uh, were engaged in seasonal migration uh, to these places where they get paid uh, rupees 700 for making 1,000 bricks. The decision to go out of the village or to stay in the village and walk in the uh, nearby kill uh, depended on two main factors. Firstly, if the family... Uh, was concerned about their children's education, which got hampered if they migrate outside the village. They chose to stay in the village and walk at the brick kiln near the village so they can commute on a daily basis from the uh, kiln. Uh, second, if there was a dependent who could not uh, be that need to, needed to be taken care of and could not be tagged along uh, outside the village, 
the family decided to work in the kiln uh, closer to the village. Uh, the process of recruitment to brick kilns was done by jamadars or uh, the middlemen who either belonged to the same village or the neighboring uh, Muslim dominated villages. So uh, these jamadars were mostly uh, the ones who have been going to the brick kilns for, uh, for longer periods of time and now have created networks. Um, and uh, they, they recruited people for brickles outside the village in Punjab and Haryana and were mostly from the other backward uh, uh, classes and were Muslims uh, from no neighboring villages. Uh, they had material and social resources to fall back on uh, in case uh, uh, a recruit refused to go after taking uh, wage advances or uh, runs away from the brick kiln in the middle of the season. Uh, these instances were rare, although, because uh, the recruits knew very well that there is no escape out of it, as the Jamadar either belonged to the same village or the neighboring village, and by coercion or by humiliating the family will take back whatever is due to him. So this is the reason why Jamadars recruited, uh, in fact, people from their own villages uh, and or the people they were uh, already acquainted with. Uh, the work of a Jamadar started from recruiting the laborers, paying them the advance uh, uh, given to him by the uh, Malik uh, or the uh, owner of the brickle, giving weekly allowances to the laborers, keeping a vigilance on them so that they do not uh, leave the work in between and go. And uh, in exchange of these services, uh, the, uh, the Jamadar or the middlemen got uh, 25 rupees per uh, thousand bricks as commission. Uh, the reasons for seasonal migration uh, from uh, also, yeah, uh, so the Jamadars uh, usually uh, gave interest free wage advances, which were called Peshgi, and uh, they were depended. Uh, the, and the Peshgi was uh, on the basis of how many family members are going to go to the Brickle. For children, the amount was uh, 5,000 rupees, uh, and for adults, the amount was 10,000 rupees. Uh, the reasons for seasonal migration uh, that is from January to July every year to different sites of work were many. Uh, first, the Dalits uh, were either landless or marginal landholders, uh, which is which was not sufficient to sustain their families. So they needed some extra sources of income. Uh, work in agriculture was erratic and not enough to sustain them. And if Dalit households migrated to the uh, brickles, they got interest-free cash advances, also called Peshgi, which was like a lifeline to them as it not only covered their daily household expenditure, but it, it was also useful in marriage ceremonies, death uh, uh, ceremonies or health-related expenditure. Uh, Peshgi also reduced uh, their uh, uh, dependence on um, upper caste money lenders for loans. And uh, these advances were, uh, uh, they proved to be uh, uh, of use uh, uh, basically for consumption purposes during uh, lean periods of work. Um, uh, the, yeah, the amount of uh, PhD I already told you. Uh, so child labor was a common site at the brick hills where children engaged in a variety of tasks uh, um, ranging from preparing the mud and molding the bricks to carrying them on their heads from one place to uh, another. Uh, also, uh, Dalit women uh, uh, were uh, restricted by patriarchal boundaries and they could not actively go out and uh, seek work. So it was only when uh, an upper caste Rajput landlord came to uh, the Dalit uh, uh, region or the um, Mohalla to actively search for laborers. It is only then that the women could go to work in the uh, fields. Also, uh, the women uh, generally uh, worked in groups of uh, five to seven, uh, and uh, the women were not allowed to go alone uh, to work in the fields of the Rajputs because uh, I, I mentioned one of the quotes here. So I cannot go alone to work in the Rajputs uh, uh, field. My mother-in-law uh, and husband say that it is against the norm of the family. When my mother-in-law was newly wed, her husband also did not allow her to go to the Rajput fields. We don't trust the Rajputs. Their intention is bad. So, uh, and also Rajputs were not just employers, but also moneylenders. Uh, 
which uh, complicated the entire picture and uh, brought in debt and labor relations together. Um, now uh, I will talk about how debt uh, and labor relations are actually uh, like labor relations are actually modeled around the entire uh, social economy of debt in the uh, field villages. So uh, labor relations are uh, uh, do not exist in isolation and are modeled uh, around the larger socio political and economic reality of a village. Uh, they are constitutive of the village's uh, social hierarchies and power structure. That is one factor that significantly contributes to molding labor relations in both uh, Kachpur and Karoli. So um, credit by money lenders is used to control the labor socially and maintain the balance of power. Uh, in Karoli, men from many Dalit households worked as knockers in the uh, Rajput households within the village. Knockers uh, are uh, uh, servants. Uh, it was a norm in the village that if a Dalit wished to take a loan from the Rajput farmer, who also acted as a money lender, the loan was given interest free. If the Dalit agreed to work as a knocker, uh, a servant or an employee for him, a fixed sum from the principal amount was deducted every month uh, from the monthly wages, which ranged from rupees 4,000 to rupees 5,000 per month. Dalit agricultural laborers entered this arrangement with the Rajput employer come money lender because firstly, they had a fixed income coming in every month which was used to pay the weekly installments of other loans, uh, uh, for instance, microfinance uh, uh, loans. And secondly, they were uh, free from the hassles of arranging for one more monthly installment to be uh, paid to the uh, Rajput money lender. So uh, the knocker was engaged in work in Rajput households in, uh, in a variety of ways. They had to tend to the cattle, uh, work in agricultural fields and engage in a variety of operations starting from sowing to harvesting of sugar cane, that is sowing, weeding, plowing, uh, even cane cutting during the time of harvesting. And they were responsible for taking the sugar cane to mills where they had to wait up for up to two days in queues uh, uh, for uh, unloading of the uh, sugar cane. Uh, it, and it was not just the Dalit man that was working in the Rajput uh, household. It was the entire family that was engaged in work in these Rajput households. So the wives and children were also engaged in the Rajput households in one way or the other. The women were often asked to clean the courtyard, uh, the house and a ghere, which is a large open space uh, in front of the house, make cow dung cakes, clay stoves and wash utensils. The children would be engaged in menial jobs like uh, sowing of sugarcane seeds, bringing groceries from the village shop or carrying agricultural produce from the field to the house. So even if it was only the uh, Dalit male uh, whom the Rajput employed, Dalit women and children also had to uh, provide free labor within the Rajput household in exchange for monthly payments. This obligation to provide unpaid labor arose from a sense of insecurity about not receiving credit in the future from the Rajput money lender in uh, uh, emergency or times of distress. Uh, the Dalit male also did not resist this practice as they were chained to debt. Uh, the practice of working as a knocker for the Rajput employers uh, uh, could be seen pr uh, prior to the pandemic, but uh, after the pandemic with the increase in credit taking from Rajput employers and also credit taking from other uh, uh, sources uh, of credit like uh, microfinance companies, uh, such cases uh, increased in the village exponentially and a lot of Dalit uh, men started working as servants for uh, uh, the Rajput uh, households. Also, with the little uh, possibilities of out-migration except to brick hills uh, or to polos, uh, rural Dalit women formed a significant chunk of agricultural labor force. Uh, they were engaged uh, in uh, various agricultural operations, starting from sowing of sugar cane and wheat seeds to harvesting. In cases that a male family member had out-migrated from the village for employment, the income generated from working as agricultural laborers was crucial as the money sent back home by the male uh, counterparts was often erratic. Uh, this was so because Dalit men were primarily engaged in precarious informal jobs, whereby sustaining themselves uh, 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 far away from home was challenging. Uh, as uh, uh, shared by a group of boys who migrated to uh, a group of Dalit boys who migrated to Chandigarh to work in a fruit uh, uh, retail mandi that they could not rent a room 
So they used to sleep uh, on pavements uh, in front of a market that closed in the night. Um, in such uh, dreadful conditions, any expectations from them sending back remittances uh, to home uh, were futile. And uh, also they could not send it uh, uh, on time. Uh, they were uh, usually erratic. So uh, dependence on agricultural work uh, for Dalit women was very crucial. Um, Rajput farmers also uh, preferred uh, to employ female labor in their fields because firstly that they had to pay them lower wage rates uh, than men. The wage rate for women in the village was rupees 200 uh, and for men it was uh, rupees 350 uh, per day. Secondly, Rajputs believed that women were more diligent in working in in the field than men who often took uh, breaks in between work and uh, were uh, not so uh, timid in front of them. Thirdly, the Rajputs uh, did not have to pay the Dalit women laborers right after a day's work. And if the women were asked to come after three, four days, they, they wouldn't uh, 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 they wouldn't mind and they would uh, agree without grumbling. Uh, it often happened that they were often deprived of their wages because of this, as uh, um, uh, they, they were deprived of their wages because of this, as they thought it was not appropriate to go to the Rajput household and ask for wages in the absence of their male counterparts. In a scenario where the Dalit male had outmigrated from the village and there was requirement of uh, labor uh, uh, in the uh, uh, Rajput's field, from whom the Dalit household has already taken loans. The Dalit women of this household felt obligated to go and work in his field. Uh, there was little scope to turn down the offer, nor there was scope uh, to negotiate uh, or bargain uh, on the wage rates. And uh, uh, there, there was a little scope to turn down the offer, despite the unwillingness owing to the exploitative methods deployed by the Rajput uh, employer to avoid any unpleasant uh, uh, situation where the Rajput creditor might increase the rate of interest on the existing loan or deny any loan advances in the future. This unfreedom in labor relations multiplied uh, uh, during the pandemic because now Dalit households were heavily indebted uh, uh, to Rajput money lenders come employers. Uh, with the male population returning to the village after the lockdown, uh, there was uh, an increase in the village's labor force which led to a net decline in their bargaining capacities in terms of wages, the duration uh, of period of work, etc. So uh, a reserve uh, uh, labor force strengthened the power of the Rajput employers and we fight fast relations in the village in this sense. Um, so this kind of exploitative relationship between the Dalit agricultural laborer and the Rajput uh, capitalist farmer was sustained through debt primarily. Uh, An economic rationale worked here uh, which led the laborers to the root to bondage whereby they lost control over their uh, labor power. Hence, that was used as a tool by the capitalist farmers to uh, exacerbate uh, the marginalization of Dalit. Yeah. Uh, uh, similar uh, unfreedom uh, uh, was seen in laborers uh, who migrated to either Brickels or Kolus before the pandemic wherein every year they had uh, a little choice of deciding to uh, out-migrate with their families or not. Since they had prior commitments of repaying the uh, loans or the wage advances that they had, uh, uh, sorry, the loans that they had taken from the microfinance companies, they had but no choice but to receive cash advances from the uh, jamadars who mediated between the laborers and their uh, capitalist enterprises, the brickles in this case. Uh, the situation worsened after the lockdown uh, with mounting debts on these families. The Dalit households in contact uh, uh, with the uh, jamadars took cash advances as high as uh, rupees, one lakh rupees. Uh, so they were tied to the Brickkill employer and had no option but to go to the Brickkill in the next season. Also, it was not a matter of one season whereby the laborers could pay the debt and then stay in the village, giving themselves some uh, respite from the harsh and exploitative working conditions. Uh, there were Dalit families in the villages who have been migrating to Brickkills in places far away for as long as 20 to 25 years. 
uh, when I asked a young girl uh, for how long she had been going to the brick kiln, she replied, I was born at a brick kiln site. So the Dalit households had entered a vicious cycle of debt and poverty and exit options from which uh, were very scarce or non-existent. Such cases were more prevalent in Karoli than in Kachpur uh, because occupational diversification was less in Karoli than in Kachpur, leaving migration to brick kilns or kolus a viable option for the uh, Dalit households. Also in both villages due to mechanization after the green revolution, the shrinking uh, uh, size of land holdings of Rajputs and an increase in the labor force post lockdown, demand for agricultural labor force had considerably reduced. Uh, hence the availability of agricultural work had decreased significantly where uh, dependence solely on agricultural work uh, left the Dalit uh, households high and dry. Uh, uh, now I shall uh, discuss the social and material aspects of debt uh, and build on it a little bit more theoretically. So uh, scholars uh, and uh, scholars, activists and uh, policy makers have uh, drawn a sharp distinction between market debts and uh, uh, interpersonal debts. Market debts uh, are the debt. Uh, market debts are assumed to do away with the exploitative traditional forms of money lending and uh, pave the way for freedom, whereas interpersonal debts are deemed as degrading and oppressive. So uh, policymakers have uh, been set on eradicating interpersonal informal debt, as it is often called, uh, uh, and it, as it does not align with the ideas of freedom and equality, and is rooted in social apparatuses of control like uh, caste, class, and gender. But there's a fair bit of evidence in economic anthropology that suggests that uh, no matter uh, what is the kind of debt, whether it is formal, informal, uh, uh, interpersonal or market debt, it does not prefigure the social relationships that it engenders. Uh, one characteristic uh, of a contemporary financial capitalism uh, are the new forms of exploitation that some forms of debt uh, have given rise to. These debt may include market debt with a fixed price and a contract such as microcredit or uh, consumer credit. They may also include interpersonal debt such as wage advances and contemporary forms of debt bondage and many other unregulated arrangements such as uh, uh, money lending, form broking, uh, loans from friends and relatives and so on and so forth. Um, also, uh, one needs to look at the moral economy of debt, which takes in, in, uh, into account uh, not just the economic aspect, but the social, cultural and emotional experience of debt and gives us a more complicated picture of how debt relations unfold on the ground. Uh, there are a mixture of realities uh, which need to be taken into account to comprehend debt relations in a better way, such as the emancipatory potential of debt, the moral and social obligations associated with debt, debt as a way of sustaining everyday life uh, and ensuring social protection, and of, uh, of course, debt as a source of uh, uh, bondage. Um, so it is important to look at both the social and material uh, aspects of debt. Uh, the, the social and economic aspects of debt are also related to power per se. So the power relation uh, is based in pre-existing social relations between debtors and creditors and the set of, uh, and the full set of rights and obligations that regulate social relations. Uh, these in turn relate to the various forms of protection and recognition and differentiation in a given society. So, uh, market and interpersonal debts are not mutually exclusive of each other. They often feed on one another and reinforce one another. In uh, this particular context and the case studied here, a large number of Dalit households uh, depended on wage advances contracted informally from their employers uh, and they cannot leave their employers before their debts are settled. This form of interpersonal debt uh, has quintessentially been associated with exploitation and dependency often termed as modern slavery or new bondage. Uh, these kind of debts and market debts both are uh, evil and co-constituted of each other. Uh, in the case studied here, uh, particularly wage advances uh, were increasingly stemming not from job shortages or job uncertainty or job precarity, but uh, they were stemming from uh, uh, over indebtedness uh, of the workers. Uh, which wage advances in turn uh, reinforced. Uh, 
uh, with the uh, entering finance capital entering into uh, rural agrarian economies there is an increasing dependence on market debts like uh, loans from microfinance institutions which is leading to over indebtedness in, in indebtedness and a situation where debts are being taken to repay previous debt uh, so debt in itself uh, does not have the potential to dominate or to protect or to emancipate Uh, what matters is the way in which a particular debt relationship is articulated with other forms of interdependencies, uh, which is why debt cannot be seen in isolation and is situated in a particular social economic context. Debt is uh, nothing new in the rural Indian context, but the comparison with historical uh, sources uh, show that the sources of debt used to be limited previously. For rural landless households, this was usually re uh, restricted to uh, in uh, restricted to indebtedness to upper caste landowners. Uh, debt has boomed uh, over the past decade uh, in the uh, countryside with the prolific uh, proliferation of market loan choice, further deepening uh, worker dependency on wage advances and on other forms of interpersonal debts, which in turn reifies caste relations. So there's one loan feeding off another loan. Um, we, uh, wage advances have brought about harsher working conditions and lower wages than would otherwise have been the case in uh, those sectors. Um, as observed in other parts of India, uh, the work is seasonal and wage advances are given out during off-season. Employers and job recruiters deliberately use debt to ensure the loyalty of uh, uh, labor force during the season and to cut costs. Workers work for six to eight months for their creditor on a piece rate basis, and the accounts uh, are settled at the end of the season. Uh, some just about manage to pay off their accounts uh, in one season, while others have to uh, go for another season as well. The indebted workers are paid significantly less than other workers. It is also clear that the living and working conditions are extremely bad and uh, uh, have remained uh, unchanged uh, uh, throughout the decade. Uh, also, workers have to work for 12 to 14 hours uh, uh, per day. Um, for brick kiln workers, they have to work at nights in a very physically demanding context for a tiny hourly wage uh, that is significantly lower than other forms of employment. Um, so in the uh, countryside, the financial landscape has significantly changed. Opportunities have increased and households' financial needs keep on growing. Traditional lenders now, uh, which are dominant caste, his, uh, historically specialized in uh, money lending, uh, landowners and local elites, now coexist with private uh, financial companies, which have uh, understood that the working poor, including seasonal migrants, are a new market niche. Uh, some concluding points uh, on uh, uh, how debt is actually seen as uh, uh, Dalit households uh, in uh, the fieldwork context. So uh, the ideas of uh, emancipation and empowerment are very complex. Uh, debt and bondedness arising from it is often seen uh, as a protective safety net that not only promises the Dalit laborers fixed employment for a stipulated time, but also shows them escape route from financial dependence on upper caste money lenders who play havoc in their lives through usury. Um, the challenges of finding a job every day, the constant reaching out to people, uh, but there are al also endless negotiations and compromises that are required. Being tied uh, to a local landowner is not the same thing as being tied uh, to a brickle employer or uh, uh, a Kolu owner who is several hundred miles away from their own village. So both the employers, uh, although in these cases are upper caste uh, uh, capitalists, but local personal bonds are different and hold a different meaning to uh, outside anonymous dependency. So working for upper caste landowners is uh, symbolic of the historical domination of upper caste uh, landowners and poor Dalit laborers. Uh, being tied to a particular Brickell owner or Kolu owner is often not seen as a, a bondage uh, as wage advances are not looked as debt by uh, the Dalit households. Uh, because uh, according to the laborers, they have to pay uh, that debt by their labor. So it is uh, like their right that they get in the beginning and they uh, pay it back through their labor. Uh, this arrangement 
payment is preferred both by the laborer and the owner because on one hand where the owner gets a sure shot uh, supply of labor force for the upcoming season the debt acts as a protective safety net uh, for the laborer who otherwise has to resort to the upper caste money lenders in the village and take loans at usurious interest rates these uh, advances are given by the owner as friendly loans uh, to avoid being coming under the purview of bonded labor uh, law for violations uh, the new forms of uh, bondage are not based on older patronage time uh, with the employer, but are more contractual in nature. Uh, also, the time period for which the laborers are engaged in work with the employer is temporary and for a shorter duration, unlike the intergenerational uh, works in feudal times. For instance, laborers are employed in a brick kiln for a period of uh, six months. That is when the kiln is operational. Uh, the laborers are not tied to a particular employer, but can change employer after the season end if they repay the debt for that particular year. Another characteristic feature of uh, this new kind of bondage or neo bondage is that a uh, person extracting the surplus from the laborer is not the old landlord in its typical sense, but is a capitalist entity who runs a capitalist venture. So uh, the age old caste dominance here kind of uh, subsides and new forms of uh, uh, bondedness and new forms of dependencies uh, come in the picture. Uh, also, borrowing from uh, uh, strangers provides hope of freeing oneself from local bonds of uh, dependencies. Uh, outside credit is uh, uh, seen as a type of emancipation from local dependency bond, while in many cases slipping into new forms of domination and exploitation. Uh, here too, landless workers, uh, new options to borrow from outside their village, especially from microfinance institutions, is highly valued as it helps to uh, cut their dependency on higher caste lenders, their relatives and neighbors. Also, uh, uh, debt is uh, 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 like debt, local borrowing is open for all to see. Um, it is a matter of gossip in the village. So, uh, es to escape these rumors uh, uh, and to escape this gossip, if only uh, partially, is highly appreciated, even if it is rooted uh, in the village and local social control continue to be the most widespread enforcement mechanisms. Uh, outside lenders can ill uh, afford to issue loans without any local connections. Uh, many debtors appreciate avoiding the daily sight of their lenders face even if outside debt conditions are uh, restrictive and expensive. Um, not only do the different forms of debt fail to uh, substitute one another, but they feed off one another and are in fact co-constitutive. Debt bonded workers are tied to their employers through wage advances in a particular form of interpersonal debt, but in fact juggle various debts and enjoy widening access to market debts. Uh, while such expansion of choice uh, might be expected to help uh, emancipate them and help them break away uh, from bondage, it has only reinforced uh, their servitude. Uh, workers now need wage advances more than ever to repay uh, market debts. So as uh, I already said, there's one loan feeding off another uh, and enabling usury and also increasing dependence on local money lenders. So... Uh, New forms of debt reproduce the gradient uh, social structure designed along the lines of caste, class, and gender. And more empirical research actually needs to be done to identify other contemporary uh, sources uh, of debt in the countryside, uh, apart from uh, microcredit. And also uh, how micro, like there have been different uh, types of microfinance companies that have uh, come into the picture. So one needs to uh, do more empirical research and this uh, could be done in the future to see how uh, finance capital is entering into the rural countryside. So that is all from my side. Thank you. Thanks so much, Komal, for this sweeping yeah. overview of 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 absolutely fascinating debt labor relations in in Afanaga. Um, so i've i have i have read your work before but i i'm happy to to provide some questions but i can also see that there are very many participants here who uh, are experts within the field so uh, i think i will just provide a, a single question to start up with and and uh, well 
if if there's room, I will join again later. If not, I'm happy not to to ask more questions. But can I? Could I just so one issue I thought would be interesting to have clarified, and that is so so you paint an abysmal situation with increasing loans where the need to jump from the one uh, uh, borrower to the other and loans increasing uh, over time was that the case as well before COVID that historically loans were increasing that that the debt spiral got worse or is that something that relates to COVID only and that is all I I would I will ask for, for starters and if need be I'll come back later uh, should I uh, answer now or please yeah so uh uh, no, the, this was the situation before COVID as well, because most of my ethnographic study is before uh, COVID. And, uh, but uh, during COVID, uh, I, I have collected data through telephonic interviews, but I think uh, uh, I need to do more empirical research to actually see the, uh, how this entire uh, uh, like how the households have uh, spiraled into uh, this entire debt trap. Uh, but uh, it's not so the households were juggling with uh, multiple debts before COVID as well. Um, these uh, microfinance companies, uh, uh, as I mentioned, there were three in one village, four in other. So uh, they were already functioning in these villages, but um, since during the COVID, people took uh, cash advances from uh, uh, the middlemen uh, from uh, with whom uh, who's uh, uh, who recruited them to various vehicles. So to pay those loans for for uh, consumption loans, these microfinance companies gave uh, more loans to these people. So uh, it has definitely increased after COVID, but the situation was. Uh, uh, quite the same before COVID as well. Okay, thanks. So the floor is open for for question. One can do as Judith has just done and as Jan Bremen has just done. Just raise your hand like this. You can also use the function and raise your hand there, or you can write a message or alert me to you wanting to 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 uh, to raise a question in the chat as well. Uh, thanks. So let us start with Judith, and then Jan, and then uh, Mon Rao. Thank you. Thank you very much. That was a really fascinating account and very depressing, but also very impressive in terms of giving us um, such a strong picture of the way in which these debt relations are intertwined with the labour and the control questions in these villages. Um, what I, the, the questions I wanted to rise, raise were firstly about resistance, really, and, and is there any sort of perception amongst the um, people with whom you're working of the dangers of indebtedness and the possibilities of trying to stop getting so heavily indebted and any, any attempts of any kind of social movements or NGOs or anyone to resist this debt increase or this debt trap? And then the second question, uh, well, what observation really is that what, one of the things that's really interesting about what you're, you're showing us is, is there is this, um, ma this uh, general view that um, it's helpful to give more formal and better sources of credit, but actually your account of how they feed into all the other sources of credit and the whole credit relationship is quite chilling. So it's obviously giving a very strong message to the people encouraging what they might call formal credit or better sources of credit, um, that they have to be aware of the fact that this is very often actually making the problem worse and not better. That's just my two observations for now. Thank you. Yeah, uh, thank you for the uh, question. So uh, uh, resistance uh, per se from NGOs or any other social groups or social movements uh, in the these two particular uh, villages, uh, uh, there is no such uh, uh, NGO or any other uh, movement per se taking place. I have uh, written elsewhere and presented elsewhere the politics of bargaining that most uh, Dalit women laborers are engaged in because there's uh, uh, little 
scope for an organized action, considering the kind of uh, uh, vulnerable context that they are placed in. So resistance in uh, those terms, there's no organized resistance per se, because uh, the vulnerability is such that even, uh, for instance, uh, there's no single wage rate in the village because there's always somebody who's willing to work at a lower wage rate and this has happened uh, like this has act, ex exacerbated during covid uh, a lot because uh, people did not people lost their jobs uh, who had migrated outside the village came back and uh, now even wage rates had reduced in the villages so uh, yeah so resistance has not taken place in uh, that sense there are uh, small everyday forms of resistance and bargaining that are uh, the, done by the women. Uh, also uh, about uh, formal credit. So uh, I've basically, uh, so mostly these uh, Dalit households are could not access uh, formal sources of credit, which we are talking about, like the institutional sources of credit from banks and everything, because uh, they do not have land uh, to put as collateral for these uh, uh, loans. So uh, the credit, uh, the market credit that uh, I am basically referring to here is the microfinance institutions. So uh, which have pl uh, proliferated uh, in the region in the past decade. So uh, yeah, so that is the uh, credit uh, option that I'm talking about here and how it is feeding into uh, another loans and um, in a way enabling usury and increasing the dependence on uh, upper caste uh, money lenders. Thanks. Jan Bremen? Please, uh, you are, you're still mute, Jan. Yeah. Am I audible now? Yeah. Yes. Okay. Uh, thank you, Kumal. That was a fine presentation and a good piece of research. I have no questions. I have uh, some suggestions. Yeah. Uh, do capitalize on your gender. Because uh, most uh, of the research done uh, is not by males still, but by uh, uh, but by female. It's not by females, but by males. So do assert your gender. Look at it from a female perspective to what you are writing about and thinking about. Uh, uh, for instance, uh, sexuality. The way uh, uh, Dalit women, uh, Adivasi women are are uh, being victimized uh, throughout uh, the country, but I'm sure also in your uh, villages. It's a difficult uh, subject to, uh, to touch on, but uh, that's why I would, uh, uh, I would say don't do it by telephone, but go there, look at them, sit with them, and be a part with them. The female perspective is very important, and that is still understated, much understated, also in the kind of research which you have been uh, uh, eminently uh, doing. Uh, a second uh, issue, and I have to cut short because I have to, uh, to be off uh, immediately after I, so I even can't listen to your uh, reply, but uh, do look at the fabric of the household. How is this happening? Not only that, but also migration sets up the balance changes the balance in the household. Uh, and not only in terms of power, but also alienation of people moving out and not bothering about who stay back. And the other way, that people who go out become more hybrid in the village when they come back and they don't have the leverage anymore before they went. That, that from a female perspective would be very important if you can touch upon it. Thank you for a wonderful presentation. It was a pleasure to listen to you. All the best to all my Thanks. other friends. Thank you. Thanks, Jan, for, for staying to, so you could provide some comments. Thanks a lot. Kamal? Yeah, uh, I mean, yeah, it's something to look 
look at uh, i haven't really looked at uh, questions of sexuality and uh, i've been looking at the entire thing from a political economy perspective so yeah that 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 could be looked at mm -hmm. But it's something that, if I may just come in here, it's something that, for example, uh, uh, Isabel Guerin has sought to do in her more, most more recent work, where she links her, her long-standing political economy perspective to an understanding of particular livelihoods of particular sets of women, and and of course it's something uh, something that uh, uh, Jonathan Perry has done in his in his piece Brick, Sex and Mortar. That so so it does show that it's possible to go down that route certainly. Yes. Um, uh, uh, Mohan, thank you, Jens. Uh, can you hear me? Yes, you're fine. Good. Very good. Uh, thank you uh, to the speaker for uh, giving us a uh, really a a, a wide ranging tour of the landscape that she was uh, researching. Uh, I am struck uh, by how much things have changed and yet how little things have changed. Uh, if you look at uh, uh, indebtedness studies or caste studies going back uh, 50 years or even 100 years, I dare say, uh, you'll find many echoes from your study. Uh, yes. Although Obviously, there are many changes that you report. For, for, for example, the presence of microfinance companies in the locality. Uh, that said, there are two persistent issues which I would like to hear your uh, views about. One is the obvious one, which is the interface or relationship between debt and Dalit Dham. Mm. Uh, you know, you can be exploited as a Dalit, even without debt. And you can be exploited as a debtor, even without being a Dalit. Yeah. So these are two in principle independent dimensions of exploitation, domination, whatever you want to call it. Uh, and uh, to my mind, uh, the question is, is there a double burden of debt for Dalits? In fact, a triple burden, if you consider that you're dealing with Dalit women in particular. Uh, so that's something that uh, uh, would be a useful question for you to raise in your dissertation and beyond and to present uh, some answers based on, uh, on your evidence. Incidentally, I, I do want to make a side remark about the question of sexuality that came up with uh, Jan Remens. Uh, uh, question. There is something you've said about sexuality in your talk. You've repeatedly mentioned mm -hmm. how Dalit women were told by their mothers or themselves said that they would not go to the Rajput's homes, either to negotiate yeah. wages or to work in the fields and so on. What is that if not sexuality? I don't think this question, would, th mm -hmm. this proposition would have emerged from any Dalit man, right? So you know, I, I set that aside. So these issues, you know, keep coming back in a sense. Anyway, so my first question is about Dalits and um, indebtedness, whether there is a double burden or a triple burden uh, to being uh, a Dalit. My second question is kind of related, and that is uh, you brought up a question about theory, you know, along the way in your presentation, you said, let's, uh, let's also consider uh, theory. Um, yeah. I think that's very important. But I would say in addition, let's also consider history. Uh, because I could hear echoes of history throughout your talk. Uh, there is the stigma of being a Dalit. There's the stigma of being indebted. These are two historical dimensions of Indian villages uh, and not necessarily only Indian villages. Uh, but is it possible, is it possible that a lot of what you're trying to document reflect the force of history? For example, to, to the extent that Dalit, Dalits in particular, Dalit women, are trying to run away from their historical past, trying to escape their historical past, 
how does that inform the relationships that you're, that you're discussing? You see, clearly, if you take that kind of a historical approach and the importance of Dalit, non-Dalit relationships in the village context uh, coming inherited from history, if you take that as an important dimension, uh, then clearly you can, cannot reduce the phenomena of indebtedness to a market relationship. However, you may theorize uh, market-based uh, indebtedness, whether you see that as a kind of a, you know, neoclassical textbook type of, uh, you know, supply demand relationship, or whether you regard that as a kind of an exploited relationship in a Marxian mode, no matter how you regard it. My, my point is the milieu that you're describing of indebtedness is not simply any kind of market relationship because there's a weight of history that is coming in. And I th I heard a number of echoes of that coming in in your talk. So it might be very interesting to see you develop that aspect, you know, to, to bring to bear on your dissertation, both theory and history, and what's a separate light that history uh, and historical perspective throws uh, on your subject. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you. Uh, yeah. So uh, I'll uh, just comment on the second one first uh, regarding history. So uh, you rightly said uh, during fieldwork also narratives, uh, whenever I was talking about indebtedness or uh, uh, the labor relations between the uh, older generations of Dalits and uh, the new generations of Dalits. So this aspect of uh, servitude and bondedness actually came up and even the new generation, uh, uh, like even women uh, talked about like how things have changed and earlier uh, during uh, our forefathers times, we used to do these this for Rajputs, we used to do this for Rajputs. So yeah, the component of history is very much uh, inbuilt uh, in this entire thing. I need to build more upon that. I haven't really, uh, you know, uh, try to put it all together but uh, yeah it was very much present in all the narratives uh, uh, that that were coming up um, and regarding your question about uh, uh, debt and dalit dam or uh, triple burden um, the kind of uh, the the socio economic context of the dalits uh, especially dalit women uh, that they are situated in uh, first of all, there is landlessness. So uh, when there is no land, there is no access to institutional sources of credit. So here comes in uh, the major sources of informal credit, which because most of the uh, Rajputs uh, who are even small or marginal farmers, they do get uh, credit from banks from uh, on the basis of their lands. There's a Kisan card. Uh, which which is uh, which they can take loans up to five lakh rupees. So it's it, it is somewhat somewhere related to uh, ca their caste, their social social situation, and obviously it is like historical oppression that's uh, there. So uh, yes, there's a triple burden on uh, that, and because of their uh, caste and gender position, Dalit women per se are at uh, like a more disadvantaged uh, level than uh, Rajput women. Because uh, as I told that Rajput women were also uh, acted as uh, uh, creditors in the village. So they also had their uh, source of income coming from uh, their uh, male counterparts or they took loans from microfinance companies which they disbursed uh, among the Dalit women. So this kind of, uh, uh, you know, the social situation where they are situated in actually leads to a kind of uh, uh, triple burden for them. So it's, uh, it, it cast uh, does play a role here and it's not uh, uh, that if the creditor uh, and the debtor, there's, there's a caste relation also. It's not just a creditor-debtor relation. So there's, there, there are other factors working there as well. Do this, you would like to come in here, please? 
You are, you're, yes. yes. Sorry, I'm unmuted. Um, I just wanted to, to add in there that, I mean, that's where the relationships within the household are so important. Um, we didn't hear anything in your presentation about the relationships between different members of the household. And so when you're talking about Dalit yeah. women and debt, what you're talking about is a whole scheme of debt in which is involving not just the Dalit women, but the household. And then the whole question of how the different household relationships work can, becomes extremely important. So I would like to, following on Jan, um, Jan and others, encourage you to spend more time looking at the intra-household relationships and how important those are in this whole question. Thank you. Yes, uh, I haven't really looked at intra-household dynamics and um, you know how control of resources, decision making, and all these aspects. So, yeah, that is one uh, area that could be definitely looked at. Yeah, and and maybe also not. Could someone that I think I got it. Um, so um, it's. Where, 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 where. <laughs> so, so you are also talking about uh, particular loans of, from women to women, etc. So, so, so there's maybe something in your data that you can that you can tease out certain kind of relations from as well. That this is not a question; it's just a saying. There, there's maybe something in there that, that could still disaggregate and 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 be worth thinking through. But what I really wanted to say now was was in part to 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 marvel over the kind of 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 of, of uh, discussions we have here. It is it is a pleasure to be part of a group with people that have worked in this field for a long time and and really can draw on 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 insight. So 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 thanks to everyone that is part of this. That of course shouldn't stop uh, uh, scholars that that are of, of more recent. Uh, Origin from taking part, and 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 for that uh, reason, I, I would just like to go to the to the chat now. And Shreya, um, I can see there's one question in the chat. Is there anything else? And would you like to take charge of that? Yeah, sure. So there's a question from Shruti who's asking uh, two things. One is, were there no uh, SHGs or other credit sources like agricultural credit that some of the marginal Dalit farmers were making use of? So that's one. And the second one is, could you say something about the work participation rate of Dalit women in the two villages? Does migration of men and thus high participation of women in wage work not make any difference to practices like parda still? And uh, can I just ask, ask a small question of my own? <laughs> um, well, I mean, I think there are two questions. One is, uh, I, I'm kind of thinking, so of course you're telling us that the debt relation is... Uh, and, and kind of connected to labor control, it reprodu reproduces a kind of caste hierarchy. But I'm also thinking the other way from, from the dominant caste and kind of agrarian capital, uh, is, is this the primary mechanism through which they establish their dominance? So I'm, I'm wondering if debt is the primary mechanism of establishing their dominance or are there kind of other mechanisms uh, also? So it's, it's, it's a bit from the other side, uh, perhaps. Um, yeah, and I think, I, and I think this, the other thing is something that I think Judith uh, briefly picked up on, which is, you know, some kinds of debt are, are better than other kinds of debt, perhaps, you know, all, not all debt is the same. And I, I was just curious, uh, it could be that I didn't listen properly, but, but I was just curious if, if, if you had any sense of what, the, what these women, you know, what kinds of debt would they consider better? than the other and I mean I mean one can guess a little bit but but still I mean w you know so because because you also spend some time talking about you know debt can be emancipatory or oppressive or both and I, I just thought if you could tease out you know which of these circuits might be relatively even you know by a margin more emancipatory than the than the other and how and yeah so that would be that's four yeah. questions so, uh, <laughs> so I'll start with the debt question first. I'll come to Shruti's question uh, after your question because I'll forget then. So uh, so which debt is better? So uh, for Dalit households, what what mostly meant like a better uh, credit uh, uh, debt option was where 
they could get instant credit uh, without producing any collateral, uh, without uh, uh, doing any bargaining on or negotiation with the uh, interest rates. And so it uh, boiled down to uh, microfinance loans because uh, they were easy to access. Uh, and also the payment of uh, these debts was uh, easy for the working class households because they had to pay weekly installments. And uh, it was easier for them to work a week, collect the money and then uh, pay it back. Uh, than to, uh, you know, pay uh, like the entire amount uh, to, say, uh, uh, Rajput money lender. Uh, a, a, a huge sum of, say, 50,000 rupees in one go to a Rajput money lender. So uh, when it was, uh, you know, uh, divided into chunks, it was easier for them to repay these debts. So although uh, when, like, when we calculated the, uh, per annum interest rates of uh, uh, these loans, they were much higher and uh, they also varied. And uh, although everything was written on paper, but uh, uh, these women had no clue how much interest they were giving, what was happening. So uh, there, there was a lot of exploitation uh, in these debts also, but uh, uh, this was the most preferred uh, source of uh, uh, credit for the Dalit households. Uh, also, what are the other ways uh, uh, through which uh, social control is maintained is uh, through it is, is debt is definitely one of the most important things that uh, came up in the narratives because uh, there is not even one uh, woman who did not who did not mention about uh, uh, being indebted to a particular employer, how they're obligated to work for them. And if uh, they did not, if they had other opportunities to work in the village and they did not have to work for the Rajput uh, uh, households, then uh, their situations would be uh, much better than uh, what they were. But uh, uh, also political power was another uh, way through which this worked and especially through uh, you know through uh, the social welfare schemes so as i told that uh, in one of the villages the uh, village head was a rajput and uh, it, so everything in in that village uh, even the dalits were not getting uh, uh, norm, like uh, pds uh, the ration uh, every month so this was another way, like the uh, political uh, power that was uh, uh, being exerted by the upper caste on the uh, Dalit households. But uh, yeah, the, the economic aspect of uh, uh, all of it was uh, very important in okay. that case. Um, now I'll go to Shruti's question. Uh, so there, there were no SHGs. Uh, in the um, in these um, uh, study villages, uh, there were groups. There were joint liability groups which the microfinance uh, uh, companies have formed, and uh, they were not SHGs in their uh, uh, you know in their proper sense. They were uh, they, these groups uh, which took joint joint liability, and also. Uh, other sources of credit like uh, agricultural credit, uh, yeah, th there were few uh, Dalit households that availed uh, this credit, but uh, uh, because most of them were migrating to, uh, uh, you know, uh, outside the village, uh, even uh, who were uh, uh, marginal landholders, so they did not, they did not uh, actually, because of all the bureaucratic process and everything, they did not actually kind of... Uh, right to avail these uh, uh, this agricultural credit because i'll tell you one example that one of the um, so the, they, these banks have agents uh, uh, who are uh, from the village itself so uh, there was a punjab national bank uh, uh, in the village which used to uh, give agricultural credit to the um, uh, farmers there. So this person who was an agent was a Rajput and did not really uh, brought into fold uh, and told the Dalit households about 
the Kisan card and various other schemes uh, that are in place. So there was also this angle uh, which was there. So they could not uh, access that agricultural credit. Uh, the work participation rate of Dalit women, the, uh, the migration of men and thus high participation of women in wage work. So, uh, yeah, so uh, also uh, the age of the women is very important when it comes to uh, working in the Rajputs fields. So newly married uh, uh, women who were uh, uh, the daughter-in-laws of the house were not allowed to go outside because it was only the older women uh, who were allowed to go and work in the fields because uh, uh, you know it was said that now they there's no danger to their uh, they, they are like much more they they can save their honor and uh, there's but if a young woman is going out and working in the fields so there's more danger of sexual violence and everything happening so it did not actually do uh, like there were restrictions put on the woman and she was not allowed to go to the Rajput fields, but uh, they, there was no uh, such uh, change in the uh, Parda system that took place in the village. Thanks. So um, I, I have to admit that I put myself on and, uh, and I know that Steve also would like to ask a question. Uh, Chris, was it a hand from you before as well? No. Okay. Good. So good to know. So I will. I will. I will. Put the Judy's and uh, hand. Good. So thanks. Um, maybe we should take a couple of questions just to just to um, make sure we can we can cover as much ground as possible. So uh, so my my is a, mine is a mixture of of, of a comment and, and a question, and it it is it, it goes on two angles. The one is um, now. Uh, this village, the villages you have worked in, are Rajput village, villages, and I, I know from what you've said when we met previously, that that you say that that might mean that there are differences between them and the conditions and the oppression of Dalit workers there and elsewhere. Um, that, that of course interests me because I have also worked in Musafanagar district, not very far from where you are working uh, uh, with Dalits in Jad villages. Um, so it'd be interesting if you could expand of how much you think that means for that particular predicament here. Um, now, uh, it also sort of relates a bit to debt. Uh, your, your debt, without, uh, in spite of what Mon Rao says, one should not re reduce debt to debt, but one should indeed see it in, in historical context, etc. The, the, it is interesting to see the difference in studies of Dalit and debt in India, where uh, Isabel Geren's work from, from Tamil Nadu shows ever increasing debt. Where my own work nearby you shows that 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 the the Dalits there are annoyed that they cannot get loans when they migrate to the brick kilns. They would prefer to have loans, but they're not available to them anymore. Um, and and the work that uh, I was involved in, but that uh, Ravi Srivastava was in charge of in, in in the construction sector in Delhi, showed there were loans for most people, but it was at around the level of what they could be paid off in three months' time. So it was a loan. It didn't tie them in forever, and certainly not from one job to another. And it seems what you're talking about is a, is a more insidious kind of loans. Uh, so again, how does it be interesting to get your, your, the extent to which you can say something about how specific or how general you think this is. Um, also, let me just add, it is interesting that those Dalits that can get rid of the loans to, to the, uh, the, that they've taken from the, from the Rajput, not from the employers. So the, the local the local loans are the worst, it seems, from as as from what I can glean from from your from your uh, presentation. Should we just uh, ask Steve to put his question in as well, and then we can have a last round of discussions afterwards. Steve, um, my question, well, is two, but the first one is, you haven't referred to technology 
of the villages and its agricultural base over the law over the history you're talking about and i ask the question then does this mean it's remained relatively the same or has there been major technical change but it's just been absorbed by the relationships you describe and the second quick question was i thought you said you were iit kampor i'm really interested to hear that does Kampur now have an anthropological department? Have you given seminars there? Okay. Sorry, can I just say one thing again? Sorry, there's just one question on the chat by Daniel. So I'll just say it, which is, how does your research complicate the field view of caste? Which I think is interesting from a sociology kind of anthropology perspective. It's, it's just how does it complicate the field view of caste? So if you can just answer okay. Excellent, Komal, over to you. And please leave us a bit of time also for, for a last round of comments. Okay, so uh, I'll start with uh, Jens's question. So Jat and Rajput villages, so uh, uh, there is a lot of difference in the culture, customs, practices, and uh, in fact, values of Jats and Rajputs. So Jats uh, are... Uh, not as uh, uh, caste strict as Rajputs are, which can be seen uh, in the Dalits uh, as well. And last time when I met Yens, he used a term, there's a Rajputization of Dalits happening in these villages. So the Parda system and uh, the kind of uh, patriarchal uh, boundaries that are put on Dalit women are uh, very much being borrowed by the Rajput uh, uh, households uh, there. So um, it, I, I have visited Jat villages, I haven't conducted field work there, but I have visited Jat villages. This kind of uh, uh, parda system and this kind of, uh, you know, the boundary between the man and the woman is not so much seen in Jat villages uh, as uh, compared to the Rajput villages. So uh, yeah, that, uh, that's one thing. And uh, also, uh, you, you asked about uh, local loans uh, uh, are the worst. Uh, uh, you talked about that. So, yeah, so um, even uh, uh, Dalits prefer to take loans from Rajput money lenders than taking loans from their own community, from the Dalit money lenders, because uh, they have to. Uh, they are living in the same mohalla, they are li living in the same locality, they have to see their uh, uh, creditor daily and they have to meet him uh, and everybody knows that this person has taken loan from this, which is a matter of shame. And if they are unable to repay those loans, it is, uh, uh, it is a uh, you know thing of gossip in the village and everything. So they try to go as far as possible from that own uh, village setting. So as I said, that wage advances are really not seen as loans by uh, laborers. They, 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 they don't think they are bonded or anything like that. It is the local dependency that they want to get rid of because um, they there are aspirations, there's the question of dignity and uh, everything that uh, comes up here. Uh, then... Uh, uh, the uh, Steve's question about uh, technology. So uh, I haven't really looked at uh, the changes. Uh, I was supposed to do a uh, um, extensive uh, survey on uh, the changes in technology that have uh, taken place in the village, but I didn't really do that. I uh, so. Uh, whatever sense I've got, there's uh, mechanization has increased in the villages. I can't comment on uh, how much and uh, to what extent, but uh, since uh, previous times it has increased and which has had an uh, impact on labor relations. This is this is uh, come from oral narratives where people have said that now they are tractors and now they are uh, pumps and so now we do not have to go for manual irrigation and things like that. So that has come up and also uh, IIT has a department of humanities and social sciences where uh, uh, there are uh, different disciplines sociology psychology philosophy uh, and finance 
So I am doing my PhD from the sociology department. It's quite old, not famous, but yeah, it's pretty old. So the idea was that engineers also should uh, be, uh, you know, they should also be humans. So they should be taught social sciences. So yeah. <laughs> oh, wonderful. Sorry, the, the, there was the, the questions for, for, from Daniel as well in, in the chat. Uh, yeah. Uh, the field view of cars, that is a difficult question and I, I will have to ponder more upon it. I have kind of uh, written it in my methodological section, but uh, I, I'll have to think about it. I'll get back to you, Daniel. Uh, Wise move. Then, uh, let, us, let, us, let us just take a, take a round for any last comments, questions, brief comments, questions. Uh, Judith, you, you had a hand up. I feel I've had my turn, but I just wanted to say that just picking up on Mohan's point, what's quite chilling about this account is how similar it sounds to going back to Malcolm Darling in the 1920s. I mean, this incredibly oppressive um, situation in which the loans and the debt play such a strong and important role. So I would have liked to have heard you also, I think you could make much more of this, talking more about what other changes have taken place in the economy since then and how much change in fact has taken place. And then reflecting on how is it possible to have these sorts of relations continuing through so much economic change. And it's that relates very much to the work that I'm doing in Tamil Nadu, which is the surprising fact that despite what think we think of as modernization, economic development, all sorts of things happening, some of these relationships are so strong still and are so, so oppressive still. So I would like to, my comment is, I, I hope you could make more of that. And I think I won't say anything more than that. Thank you. And and in a sense, also, in spite of the general uh, change in caste relations that has taken place in UP in, in other ways through the emancipati emancipation of, of Dalits and standing up for, for their rights in general, uh, that has created space. But not in relation to what you're describing here so 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 there are change but no change uh, there's also a long uh, uh, long apologies there's a there's an insightful comment as well in the in the uh, in the in the chat uh, Sreya, will you once more uh, take care of that thanks yeah, so this is by um, Gora, who's asking first, uh, you started by telling us, uh, you know, there are two villages, but then somewhere along the way, he lost the sense of, you know, what's the difference between the two in terms of debt and freedom uh, in relations amongst uh, Dalit women. So, you know, really, like, is there a difference between the two? two, two villages that you've studied? Um, and the second was, could you present an anecdote from your field work, especially, you know, from young Dalit women, which doesn't fit the narrative, which challenges your narrative of uh, continued um, and freedom of Dalit women. So. And be before I hand back to you, so Chris, once more, was that a hand? So I just don't mean that I'm not picking on you, but but was that a hand before? <laughs> no, no. In that case, uh, Mohan Rao. You are mute, Mohan. Uh, I want to pick up on um, one question of change, which is related to uh, Steve Biggs. Sorry, sorry about that. Uh, Steve Biggs' question, uh, but also Judith's uh, uh, last comment, uh, and that is. Uh, looking for change in your study area. Uh, I think one important area that you've flagged already is the willingness to take loans from distant sources and unwillingness to take source, uh, loans from close sources, nearby sources, even from other Dalits, for example. Yeah. Uh, in, in one sense, that seems to explain itself, right? I mean, uh, uh, in terms of status, in terms of uh, shame, in terms of all those kinds of uh, considerations. 
but if you went back 30 years or 50 years in the same villages, you'll find very few people have access to outside the village sources of money. So credit was essentially local. In fact, even employment tended to be heavily local. Uh, in, and that is equally understandable because when you're within a local domain, there is familiarity. And with familiarity com comes what the economists would call reductions in transactions costs or information costs uh, and so on. And therefore, villagers tended to contract with each other a lot. I think that is breaking down. And your study is an example of that breakdown happening very visibly and perhaps very strongly. So that's something that you might want to pick up. And whether this has anything to do with technology in the sense in which Steve Biggs was using that word, I do not know. But certainly technology in the broader sense, because this uh, interconnectedness to the re rest of the world comes from improvements in transportation technology. People are much more mobile uh, now than they used to be 30, 50 years ago. And so, and along those lines, you can uh, generally begin to make a case of how internal factors, sociological, anthropological uh, factors, conspire with external change because technology, because of technology in the broad sense, to produce certain kinds of change which would have been unthinkable uh, 50 years ago for a, Dal a poor Dalit woman or man or family uh, to, to go outside the village to borrow it would be unthinkable. The, the first question we're asked uh, that, that the uh, outside creditor would ask is, who are you? Who are you? You know, uh, the, 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 that sort of unfamiliarity with the outside world, I think clearly no longer exists. And that might be a, a, a theme for you to uh, pick up. Thanks, Thank Mark. So, oh, Kamal, a, a, a brief, it, it, you don't have to reply to all the points raised, but a brief comment slash reply, please. Uh, with. Yeah, so, yeah, I'll, I'll, uh, this technology aspect is uh, uh, interesting. And also, uh, I think there are, uh, I, I went to the field last in uh, 2020, and after that I was uh, uh, in touch through telephones and everything. But uh, I think there are uh, uh, apps also coming up which are uh, giving loans now instantly. So technology, uh, one needs to explore because I've, I've heard it in other uh, rural areas and I'm sure uh, they're coming up uh, in Muzaffarnagar as well. So yeah, that's one thing that uh, needs to be looked at. Um, and uh, uh, Gaurav's question about uh, the difference between the two villages. So the difference between the two villages, uh, uh, I, I've mentioned uh, bits and pieces here and there, but uh, um, the labor relations kind of operated in the same way in both the villages. The uh, relationship between the uh, Rajput employer and the Dalit laborer, but uh, uh, there were a uh, few uh, instances where there were other, uh, you know, so, so in one of the villages, uh, people were more, uh, the, the preferred source of credit was microfinance because they had monthly source of income coming from working in shops in Muzaffarnagar, whereas uh, in the other village, the preferred source was not microfinance because they did not had, uh, they were solely dependent on agricultural uh, labor. Uh, agricultural work and it was erratic so they had to really struggle to uh, you know uh, get hold of the weekly installment so uh, these were uh, small differences that uh, were in both the villages but the way in which uh, uh, the, you know uh, debt and labor relations unfolded was quite similar in both the villages um, then uh, uh, 
an anecdote from my field work, especially from my conversation with a young Dalit woman, uh, which did not cleanly fit in the sun freedom was, uh, uh, there were man many actually, and uh, young uh, Dalit girls who were going to college in Muzaffar Nagar, and uh, uh, one of the girls who was working uh, as a teacher in a private school, so uh, she was uh, strictly told by her mother to not come to the fields to help her in the fields to study and to get out of the village so uh, this was one of the instances where it did not uh, like came into unfreedom and the um, you know the exploitation kind of ended with one generation and the another one was trying to get out of uh, that entire uh, setup and uh, go ahead uh, to other places yeah Maybe that is a very good uh, fitting point to to finish today's discussion. Leave the village to become free. That yeah. <laughs> um, thank you to everyone who have taken part in the discussion, and it's been it's been a very great discussion today. Uh, and of course, thanks a lot to our speaker Komal Singh for this presentation that inspired us all to to comment and discuss. This is our last Agrarian Change seminar slash webinar. This term we will return in January um, with the full program as usual, which will be both face-to-face uh, -face and uh, webinar-based. So I hope to see s some of you back then. For now, all that remains is once more to thank Komal and everyone else. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. And yeah. Yeah. Okay.